I'm President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. I want to welcome you to uh, bright and early here in Washington, D.C., to an important conversation that we're going to have, and especially those of you who are joining us on the live stream from all over the world. Uh, I'll start off with a little, little anecdote that's relevant to, to this town, Washington, D.C. I got invited right around the time our special guest, Congressman Ted Yoho, joined the Hill and became a member of Congress. Around that time, they were working on the Sustainable Development Goals, and I got invited to a meeting at the White House where I could sit in and listen to some of the discussions that were going to happen. And I showed up right on time. It was a rainy day. I had the jacket on, the umbrella, my bag. And as I was rushing to the room, someone there ushered me in. Come on, come in quickly, you know? And I thought, well, I guess I'm the last person here. And uh, it was a pretty packed room, sort of like this. And uh, there was a dais in the front. And there was a chairman there with a microphone. And there was one empty seat right next to that person. And they said, come and sit. So I ran in. Everyone was hushed and quiet waiting for me. Got all my gear off and sat and uh, realized very quickly I was in the wrong meeting. <laughs> it, this, was a, this was a private, internal White House meeting on a totally different topic that I should not have been at. And so just as noisily, I had to get all my gear and somehow shuffle out of there. And everyone was saying, who is this guy? Uh, I, I tell you that little anecdote because this is a room you're meant to be in. Uh, those of you who are here and joining us online, we want to kind of take what's happening inside Washington and open it out to our audience. We've got over a million professionals doing development work, doing aid work all over the world. Some people here in Washington, some people on the front lines, um, you know, taking real courageous risks to, to make the world a better place. And we want to make sure that we're bringing you the information you need to know what's happening. Um, and so we are delighted to continue this series of conversations with someone who is really at the center of what's happening in this town, Congressman Ted Yoho. Uh, Ted Yoho is a congressman from Florida, from the 3rd District up north. If you know Gainesville, that's, that's the part of the state he's from. Um, he's relatively new on the Hill, only a few terms now. He's in his third term. But he's really made a, a distinction for himself in that short time. He's come to Washington as a uh, small government conservative, a constitutional conservative. He's a member of the Freedom Caucus. Um, and, but he was quoted in, in the pages of DevX saying that although he came thinking he would just cut foreign aid, um, he's really come with a whole new agenda. And, he is actually the co-chair of the Effectiveness of Foreign Assistance at Congressional Caucus. And he's been doing a lot of work, including on a new development finance corporation, which I'm sure we'll be hearing about in this conversation. He sits on two key committees, Agriculture and Foreign Affairs. And he chairs the subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific. So we are really delighted to have him spend some of his very busy day here at the end of the year with us. Uh, couldn't have anyone better than Adva Saldinger, my, my colleague at DevX. Uh, if you're like me in the media business, you read the byline when you read an article and you say, okay, who's writing this? Uh, and so a lot of the pieces you're reading, you're sharing, you're talking about around the water cooler are written by Adva. She is one of the world's experts, really, on the intersection of business and global development, and I am delighted to hand the mic to her for this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. And Thank you, Congressman, for being with us. It's yes, a real pleasure. Um, we've had the opportunity to talk a little bit about your journey on mm -hmm. sort of the development policy um, agenda. And, and one of the things I wanted to just start with is sharing a little bit with the folks in the room and the folks online sort of how your thoughts have changed. You came in on this platform of sure. you've got to cut foreign aid, and now you've become sort of a, a champion of making aid more, more efficient and using it as a real tool of diplomacy and economic growth. Sure. First, I want to give a, a shout out to Raj because you opened up with an anecdote and it had humor in there. And I think that's something that is missing a lot of times up here in Washington. People are, you know, they're just, they're, they're just too wound up. And I think we need to all laugh as, you know, as a nation. Laugh at the things that, you know, we used to laugh at. And I, I hope we keep continue to do that. And as you said, I did come up here. We were going to cut foreign aid. You know, it's a waste of the taxpayer's money. And, you know, in my district, it would get standing. Uh, um, uh, applause people would stand up and cheer you right cut that and uh, I came up here and it, it's a learning experience and I said I have become a lot more learned <laughs> it's a growing experience unlike our hair you know uh, <laughs> over, over the period of time and what you realize it's an investment in our diplomacy for one thing and it's also uh, I agree I think General Mattis hit this the nail on the head when he said if you cut foreign aid buy more bullets and so knowing that, how do we use it more effectively? Um, we had a hearing yesterday on Cambodia, and we have spent $1.7 billion, or invested $1.7 billion 
of the American taxpayers' money since 1993. Is it working over there? You know, they're throwing, they've gotten rid of uh, their uh, opposition party. And so, you know, we need to look at these things. How do we make them more effective um, and wean countries off of foreign aid? And our whole goal is to go from aid to trade is the big push we want to do. And we want to, we've done that in the past. And if you look at our top 11 or 12, or our top 15 trading partners, 11, the top 12 of those were recipients of foreign aid. And that's a model I think we all need to follow and be more efficient. And so that's yeah. how we've kind of Maybe you evolved. can tell us a little bit about how, how you came to change your perspective and what sort of <sighs> arguments you think are going to resonate or what sort of, you know, a lot of people in this room and listening in are folks who believe very passionately in foreign aid. Sure. And so what are, what are the types of, of things that sort of help change your mind? What arguments should people be making when they're going to speak to folks on the Hill about why foreign aid? I'm solution oriented. You know, we look at solutions instead of so many times I see these programs or policies we have, we're treating symptoms. We're not going to the underlying solution. And, and a perfect example is Electrify Africa. Um, people were kind of shocked that I was supportive of that. You know, when you read the bill and you look at the situation, you know, um, Africa is a continent of roughly 1.11 billion people. 650 million people in Africa do not have electricity in the 21st century. 650 million people. And, um, you know, you look at the amount of money we have invested in different countries, the American taxpayers' money in Africa, and then you look at what is the results we've gotten. So being solution-oriented, if you look at the history of our country in uh, the early 1900s, the majority of people in this country didn't have electricity. But it was through a federal program working with the co-ops brought electricity to the rural areas to where virtually everybody had electricity. And so what we got, you know, I got thinking, I, I'm thinking, well, you know, if you bring power to the people, you empower people. Empowered people will change and fix their governments. And so that's how I came to that. And so we started selling that to people and they're like, you know what, that makes sense. And so coming from a, a strong conservative background, you look at the situation and say, well, what's the solution here? You know, we can keep putting money in there over and over again, and uh, you know, you all know the definition of insanity. And so, um, we've got to change the narrative, and I saw that as a way of changing the narrative. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, since you since you brought up Power Africa and the mm -hmm. Electrify Africa bill, I wanted to talk a little bit about about that because it's it was sort of a different model. It brought together sure. a lot of government agencies to work towards one goal. It. Um, really looked to bring in uh, the private sector, both in the U.S. and abroad, as you know, a part of this conversation. Do you think that's a model that will be effective going forward? And and what sort of the future? Obviously, we have we have the authorizing legislation, but sure. what is what does the funding look like? Bob, I appreciate you bringing that up. I've got uh, Jimmy Walsh back there. Raise your hand, James. He's our legislative director, and uh, he's guided me through and helped educate me and uh, uh, is responsible for a lot of the, the things I've grown in. And uh, one of the things that we found out early on was OPEC and MCC. We brought in the directors of those and went through the business model. And I, I was uh, excited about it, you know, to see, like MCC, to have a corporation, kind of a quasi-government corporation, to where they can make business decisions they have metrics on what they follow. They decide what countries they want to invest in. And with OPEC, when you look at that business model, uh, to help private com companies go into different countries and invest, those were the things that we looked at that were good models that were like, we want to emulate that. And I remember sitting with Elizabeth Littlefield. <laughs> it was, I think it was my first year up here. Well, I was really green then. Um, and uh, she was sitting there and she was talking about, you know, their budget. I think the budget was $250 million and they had, uh, they were limited to so many people. And I said, well, what do you look at? And she looks at, you know, the business model. She was looking at rate of return. And I said, well, what do you look at? She goes, if they can't bring back eight to one, we don't invest in them. I says, well, then what's, what's your failure rate? It's, and it was like 0.1%. I said, well, virtually you have no failure rate. And then they brought in like $650 million. I'm like, you mean to tell me you're a government agency and you're bringing in that kind of money and it only costs this much? I says, how come we don't know about this? We need to, we need to let everybody else know about this. And I caught myself and I said, nope, 
wait a minute, if government finds out about you, they'll <laughs> want to try to fix you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a good idea to emulate those kind of models when it comes to foreign aid today. You guys know the state of our economy. Uh, General Mattis, or um, Admiral Mullins and Hillary Clinton, I remember this, this is when I first ran. They said that the biggest threat to America is our debt. And I've been here for five years, and I'm embarrassed to say it hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. If we don't get our debt under control for this nation, we'll be, we'll be the next Puerto Rico. We'll be the, ne the next uh, Greece. And we're better than that as a nation. And so when it comes to foreign aid, we have to be better at it, and that's why we've gone through some of the reforms that we're looking at. And in terms of, in terms of funding for, for Power Africa and for sort of for, to pull you know, push forward the Electrify Africa initiative. Do you have any sense of whether we're going to see that come about or whether the administration... Yeah, I think you'll see some of that come about. Uh, how much, I don't know. I remember <laughs> this year, Jimmy, it was, yeah, it was this year we got invited to the budget committee down there. Uh, um, and uh, uh, Hal Rogers was there. Um, Nita, what's her name? Nita Lowey? Yeah, Lowey. She was there, and when I walked in, they're like, oh, my God, this guy's here. <laughs> and, uh, and I sat down promoting why we needed to fund these programs, and when there was the 32% cut uh, in foreign aid, and we, we made a strong stand and said, no, we can't do this. We need to invest, but we need to make it smarter on how we invest that. Well, you brought up OPEC. You've been a vocal supporter yeah. on the Hill. I've heard you speak multiple times sort of in defense of the agency, which obviously when the skinny budget came out early this year mm -hmm. and, and then the um, more detailed budget, it basically called um, for eliminating the, the agency. We're right. in a very different place now, it seems. Um, and mm -hmm. you're sort of at the center of, of this conversation and, mm -hmm. and of sort of pushing things forward. I know you've been hard at work um, working on a bill about the about a new development finance sure. corporation. What can you tell us about what is going to be in the bill? Um, what the timeline looks like, and and what you're really looking to achieve with with sort of a new development sure. finance corporation? You know, and I know that a lot of people have that same mind in question, or that same question in mind. Um, you know, you guys are in. I assume a lot of you guys are working with NGOs or different one of the organizations we're talking about. You know, you probably know this a lot better than I do. There's over forty thousand NGOs around the world. How do you track that? How do you keep track of those? Who's the good ones? Are they all equally? Should they get money? Or some of them running their own private agenda, their own politics? Are we getting the bang for our buck? And so, um, what we looked at were three different bills. Um, the Economic Growth and Development Act, which when you have all these entities wanting, buying for public monies to go out and do um, the policies of, of the United States and, you know, to push that agenda, how do you vet these organizations and how do you make it more streamlined to where you can have the, bring in the private monies with public monies to accomplish the goal of the United States of America. And again, if you look at what we've done um, in the Congo, I was over there with Ed Royce probably a year, year and a half ago, and we were sitting at the uh, foreign minister, or actually in the cabinet room, but the president of uh, the Congo wouldn't meet with us. His ministers did. And I, I thought it was interesting that we have given them hundreds of millions of dollars over the years. And there were certain conditions they were supposed to do that they weren't doing. And I asked this question, and it was a rhetorical question because I knew what the answer was. I says, what are you doing for social programs? And the minister says, well, what do you mean? I says, what are you doing for health care, education, things like that? And he goes, we have you. That's not sustainable. And our goal is, again, I want to wean people off from aid to trade. And so we looked at these corporations where we needed to, or these different uh, uh, vehicles that the United States have, how do we streamline that? How do we make that process simpler? Um, back when uh, USAID started, I think it was 70% 70, 70 of the money flowed from the public to the country. Now it's 93% of that money that flows is private. So again, we want to streamline that. I know we're up against time restraint here. No, so. we're, we're doing all right, I think. <laughs> um, but, but to get back to this point of the Development Finance Corporation. Yeah. So obviously OPIC is a vehicle for sort of helping to push things in a more sort of private sector development oriented direction. It's one of the 
United States' major tools. It's our development finance mm -hmm. institution. Um, but for, for years, it's been constrained. It doesn't have equity authority like many other development finance institutions. Um, it's been limited in the number of deals it can do, not by the number of deals that right. it comes to it, but by its staff and by its ability. And so folks within OPEC, sort of across the last several administrations, have been saying, you know, we've been working on reforms. We've created a really you know, strong functioning organization. We're poised for growth, but we're being held back by right. constraints. It also hasn't had a long-term reauthorization in years. It hasn't. So, so I hear you're working on a bill. <laughs> We're working on a bill, the Development Finance Corporations, which will streamline and, and remove some of these organizations, but at the same time, develop the Development Finance Corporations that does exactly what you said. Creates flexibility, it increases the budget. Um, when you look at how much we invest in foreign aid compared to, say, China or some of these other countries, we're way behind. Uh, we do a great job, I think, in overall um, in foreign aid as a percentage, or not as a percentage, but the total volume that we give out. But we put restraints on corporations where there, we could do more, but we're, there's a wall. We want to remove that wall, and we want to, instead of having five or six different development corporations, streamline it. And uh, we're going to coalesce those together into one that has more flexibility. They'll, they'll have the, in, uh, the ability to have equity funds and things like that is what our goal is. And uh, again, there'll be an oversight board where there'll be um, uh, uh, just the whole point of that is to push forward the agenda of the United States. You know, the goal is to have these countries go from where they are to trading partners. That'll raise the standard of living in there. And we saw this as a more effective way of doing that. And do you have a sense of when that bill will be introduced in the House? I think you're going to see that come out probably uh, maybe within the next three to six months. I mean, we're going through a lot of that right now. We're rehashing that. So that's our goal, Great. this Congress. Yeah. And, and I understand there's also a, sort of a parallel process in, happening in the Senate. Are you talking to your Senate colleagues and trying to figure Our out? Our team is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we sure are. And again, when we have that kind of buy-in with the different senators that we're pushing forward, I think this is something that needs to happen. We haven't had that kind of a reform in a while, and it's something that has to happen to move forward. You know, we're in a different world. Do you guys see how the world's changing today? Um, I remember when I, it was about two and a half, three years ago, we were at a, a meeting, uh, it was a conference meeting, we had a lot of the retired generals and active generals, and they were saying we were going through um, the first time that we were going through a tectonic shift in world powers that we haven't seen since World War II. The world's rapidly changing. We need to change our models to get a bigger bang for the buck in restraining economies. One of the other things I wanted to talk to you about, which I know we've all been watching really closely, is sort of the USAID State Department um, reform process. I know mm -hmm. that you led a group of congressmen in writing a letter to, to the administration asking for more information. And yep. I'm, I'm wondering if you've heard any more since then. And We're going to meet with Rex Tillerson today on foreign affairs. Uh, we haven't heard directly on that. Um, but again, we want to make sure that the money is there as a tool that the United States can use on diplomacy. We just got back from a Codell, uh, Vietnam, Singapore, and Hong Kong. And what we heard, and this is why it's so important for congressional delegations, you go there, you go to the embassy, you go to these different countries, you see the projects they're working on, you see what's working, you see what's not working, and you see the importance of those projects. The granite, I think if we look at through the totality of government, there's waste in every agency. We have got to streamline this. And this is something, if we don't streamline it, the condition will streamline it. You know, and I, I was on television with uh, Wolf Blitzer and our budget chairman and a, and a committee, and I said, we have to change the narrative in Washington. We have to address mandatory spending. Everybody wants to run away from that. You know, if you talk about Social Security, raising the retirement age or the tax level or something like that, without cutting programs, which nobody wants to do. If, if we don't reform those things, and Wolf Blitzer says, well, you're at odds with the president. He says he doesn't want to touch mandatory spending. And I says, it doesn't matter if, it pre if it's President Trump or the next president. We either deal with mandatory spending or it will deal with us. And that's why you'll be a Puerto Rico or Greece. And so knowing that, it would be imprudent for us not to start reforming these things so that they can live beyond us. And, and what, you know, if, if you, obviously you 
you know, Congress has said sort of repeatedly in, in different capacities that it wants to be a part of this reform discussion. Sure. What are some of the things that you'd like to see in a reform process? I know you recently um, introduced the multilateral aid review bill. And that, that just goes right hand in hand with uh, uh, Chairman McCall and uh, Albio Cirrus. That's to me is probably one of the most significant because what it does is it prioritizes these agencies uh, and the way the money is giving out to make sure that we're streamlining that, it's going to the most active agencies, the most successful ones. That doesn't exclude another one. You know, and I, I kind of look at it as competition. You know, if you've got all these NGOs or all these groups that you're working with, if you give, you know, say there's a hundred of them and you've got a million dollars, everybody gets, what is it, $10,000 a piece? you can't really invoke a lot of change with that. So let's take the ones that have the best track record that um, we can you know, put more money in there so they're not constrained, so that they can go out and push that agenda forward, but yet you're not excluding these because these other ones that maybe didn't make the cut this time, they come up with a better product and how to spend the American taxpayers' money to accomplish that goal. So that's why I'm excited about the multilateral aid reform. I think, I think there are people who see that bill and get a little bit sure. scared. You know, is this bill just an excuse to, you know, find a way to cut, you know, our contributions to multilateral organizations? Um, and, and how do you respond to some of those concerns? You know, that's a natural feeling. And, of course, every two years I'm up for election, so I get scared, you know. And uh, <laughs> some people get scared if I get reelected. Um, but it, it, people shouldn't be worried about that because, Competition, I remember when I was practicing veterinary medicine, uh, we had matured as veterinarians in our district. We had probably 12, nine competing veterinarians, and when a new one came in, I was always excited because we split calls between those on emergency calls, and the other ones were saying, oh, how can you, how can you tolerate another one coming in? I said, competition is good. We get better in our game. Our clients uh, benefit from this, and the animals too. Um, so competition is good in that, and I, I don't think I would be um, fearful of losing. Work harder to win. And um, again, if we don't make these reforms, if we go into the, um, the fiscal restraints that we see coming at us, if we don't reform that in time, these cuts are going to come, and there'll be less money. So I think it's prudent for us as a nation to make these reforms now, you know, and be, I always like to be proactive again, looking for solutions. Great. Well, I know we could keep chatting for a long time, but I'm sure folks in the room have questions as well. So we do have someone who will be coming around with a mic um, in just a minute. Yeah, and we'll start here. And what I'll, and what I'll just ask is that you tell us uh, your name, where you're from, and try to keep the question concise so we can get to everyone's questions. I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project. Hey, John. And, and uh, I really appreciate your comments about finding solutions. And in our experience, one of the most important solutions is decentralization, strengthening community-level governance, because that's where health education happens. And most, most of the poorest countries have no resources at that level. Um, and you mentioned this with Cambodia. It's a good example. Um, how do you see in the aid reform that's coming up, um, greater integration between democracy and governance, kind of capacity building, um, decentralization capacity building um, as a pathway to better, more solution oriented aid. You know, that's something that was kind of a crux, or not a crux, but a, a impetus of, or of pushing this forward. Um, we're working with somebody out of the University of Florida that got a, I think it was a $48 million grant. And to implement that grant, and it was to food production, fiber production, uh, protein animals in Africa, he's got to be on the ground implementing that. And what he's found out, and you know, talking to him, he's going from meeting to meeting to meeting because people want him to fly around and talk about his project. So he's spending a lot of time doing that instead of boots on the ground. And so we want to streamline that process. I don't know if that answered your question. No, it, no it's really, you know. Decentralizing. Decent, getting local government 
at the community level, county level government, the kind of government that really takes care of people's aspirations, getting that to work in more countries. And um, it, it has felt like um, there, there were some moves to get more investment in that kind of decentralization and strengthening those community level institutions in our aid programs. But um, I just wonder if that is now finally going to happen in uh, this, these reforms. That's going to be a hard thing to do. And we've talked, again, to a lot of NGOs. How do you work in a government? How do you work in a country? Which ones do you decide to go into? What if you have a country that the government's not compliant or willing to work with you? How do you invest in there the long term? Will it, this project, and I, I hope you all have this, this, um, this philosophy, work yourself out of a job. Because if you've worked yourself out of a job, you've done a good thing. You've left a sustainable project that you can look back and say, we did that. And they'll look back and say, you know what, your group came in here, you started that. But it depends on the buy-in and what we have seen and what we want to do. And that's the purpose of the multilateral um, reform, uh, multilateral uh, reform act, is you got to have a common goal. You want the buy-in. And you can't fix every country in the world. But if we can get one or two, and you can get the buy-in from the, the country, the government, and, and the people there, you can move forward. And that's what I see is, you know, we were talking about 100 different groups out there trying to do the same thing. This will, instead of, you know, reduplicating the wheel, you're going to focus, have a common goal, you get the buy-in from that government, but we want to empower you to be able to do that, but that's going to require transparency and accountability. I remember my first, I think it was the second year up here, we had Raj Shah in there from USAID, and that was right when uh, Afghanistan had gotten a billion dollars, and they couldn't account for 300 million. And, I'm, and I remember asking him, I says, where did 300 million go? And it was like, I don't know. And I think he's a great guy, but if we lost $300 million or we can't account for it, or it's in somebody's fund over here that we don't know about, you know, one of the secret funds, the American taxpayers are asking me, where'd my money go? And I've got to answer that. So if you had a billion dollars and you can't account for $300 million, maybe you only need $500 million. And it's, it's, you, we've, we've got to have a way we can stay on top of this. If not, we're throwing money away and we're not getting the results for that money. So to decentralize it, that's what we're looking at, is to empower you more so that you can work with the local governments. But you've got to have the right government to work for. All right, we have a question here, and then we'll go to the side of the room. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kurt Olson. I'm with DAI. And uh, thank you for coming to talk to us today, uh, Congressman. I usually don't ask questions, but uh, you inspired me to ask a question. <laughs> Uh, that could you were be a talking, good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, we'll see. Uh, check in with me in a couple of years. Um, <laughs> you talked about you know engaging the private sector more in in development. There's also the public side, and I was interested in what your thoughts were about domestic resource mobilization, which we're seeing in a lot of countries can have uh, a huge multiplier effect. Uh, you look at a country like El Salvador, where a small USAID investment has led to an increase in $1.5 billion in terms of revenue generated. So that countries then can take more ownership of their own development by you know raising the funds themselves. Uh, you know you need a, a obviously you need a, a government that's willing to do that. Um, but I'd like to hear what what you've been thinking along those lines and you know, what, what Congress might do. Well, I think you brought up that, that word you said, ownership. That's where you got to have that common goal. You have to have the buy-in from the other side. If not, you're doing all the work. It's, um, I use this story all the time. My mom wanted me to play the piano. For seven years, she sewed and did all this stuff to make the extra money for, for me to play the piano. The problem was, I didn't want to play the piano. You've got to find the right partners to work with, and you've got to have that buy-in. And so the buy-in comes from your original goal, selling it to the area you want to go in, knowing what we're trying to accomplish that meets our policies as a nation. And then you find a way to empower the government, the people on the ground, the individuals in that country, so that they understand. You know, we were talking in one of the countries, they're teaching them 
how to raise uh, goats and beef and all that, but they didn't have electricity. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have refrigeration. So we can raise all these produce and products and all these things, but if you don't have the, the whole supply chain there, are you really accomplishing anything? And so that's what we need to do when we look at this and when we uh, go through this uh, change and the money is going to be lent out, I want all those things addressed. You know, is it going to be perfect? Is there going to be failure? Absolutely. But I want to minimize that and work towards getting the, the best results we can. You guys have been doing this for a long time. You guys have a ton of information and ideas in every meeting we have. I tell people, this is not my office. This is the people in my district. I want you to think of this as your office, and if you could write legislation to change and make this better, more efficient, give us the ideas. I'm giving you the power to tell me what to do, basically, because again, I rely on your expertise. Heck, I'm a veterinarian, been up here for five years, but we have been vocal on things and we we're passionate about getting the results we want. Hi, um, I'm Robbie Grammer. I'm a reporter with Foreign Policy. Um, two questions, if I may. What specific tangible changes would you like to see in uh, Secretary Tillerson's State Department reform and USAID reform? And the second is, do you see any other converts to uh, foreign aid in the Freedom Caucus? And could yeah, you I do. In those? fact, um, let's see, Rex Tillerson. Um, I think it's time. You know, I, I've met with him. We're, in fact, we're going to meet with him today. Um, I think reforms need to be made in all these agencies. Um, you know, Department of Labor, I mean, we can go through every agency. There's room for improvement in all these. I think we can all agree on that, right? The goal is not to, to make it a skeleton crew. The goal is to make it effective. Again, if you look at where we are at, as a world population, you see the, the different uh, conflicts that are going around in the world today. You know. You guys have been out there working. Have we made a big improvement? Some places, yes. Where we haven't, let's change that and, and redesign that. And I think Rex Tillerson, you know, he's getting a lot of criticism, but we had a hearing on um, 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 Burma, and there was people in there from Bangladesh and one of the, uh, the acting uh, um, district or the uh, acting ambassador for uh, Bangladesh was there and she, they, they were getting chastised because they have removed 2200 people from the State Department and one one group of, of the conference was yelling at this and how irresponsible this was and I asked the question I says ma'am can you do your uh, how many people have you lost 2200 how many people are in the State Department 75,000 so you do the math it was less than 5% I think I can't remember right now and I says, I don't know if that's a good thing or not to reduce the State Department that much. My question to you is, can you do your job with the people you have? She goes, absolutely. In that case, it was probably a good reform. Um, but we want to make sure we don't shortchange ourselves either. Uh, your second question was? Uh, have you said any oh, in the Freedom Caucus. <laughs> I met with an ambassador that's a member. He's not a member of the Freedom Caucus, but he's a conservative member. And I told him that we had our economic growth and development bill. I want him to sign on it. He goes, absolutely not. I want to get rid of foreign aid. I hate it. <laughs> and he was an ambassador. And, uh, uh, and I says, exactly. That's what I wanted to do, too. I said, but, you know, here, and I'm going to be partisan here. I says, here we've got the House, White, or the Senate and the White House. We can't get rid of the Affordable Care Act. You think you're going to get rid of uh, foreign aid? <laughs> and he goes, good point. And I said, so if we can't get rid of it, which we really don't, let's reform it so we can do the best. And so he got on our bill. <laughs> so I say that because we're going to have um, Mark Green come into the Freedom Caucus, and I've talked to him. They says, yeah, we'll, you know, they're open minded. We're open minded. You know, we're not all, you know, out there wanting to cut everything. We want the best government we can get. Um, and so they're open for that. All right, we'll take a question here. Thank you. Um, I'm Deborah Kennedy with FHI 360. And um, actually, as a result of the last comments, I'm going to slightly change my question. I joined the nonprofit sector after almost four decades of working for USAID. So 
Um, I'm, I'm a little bit biased towards USAID. Um, when you were talking about constraints to growth, it's clear that through your visits and through your conversations, you've learned a lot about development and have some perspectives on constraints to growth. And I think both at state and you say there's been over administrations and over four decades, I saw lots of theories about how do you best attack constraints to growth, support countries to address those so that they graduate from foreign aid. And so um, my question is, what in addition to um, rural electrification, ownership, which you've talked about, do you would you like to see as being receiving emphasis in terms of state use aid reform. And then related to the last question was about the quality of leadership in terms of the diplomats representing. And while I agree there's always, I led human resources at USAID for a number of years, there's always room for thinning out some staffs. But I, I think particularly concerned about the loss of senior level leadership and your experienced diplomats at state um, in terms of negotiating, because if you're trying to build leadership and secure commitment, you need those kind of trusted liaisons. So for me, one of the constraints to growth is the quality of leadership in foreign countries, and that's where I really look at the quality of state and USAID officers to say, do we have the right people in the right place? Um, but a broader cons question on constraints to growth, what else would you like to see the U.S. do more of, and what would you like to see them do less of? Wow. <laughs> uh, constraints to growth. When you were talking about that, I had an example I wanted to use, but I lost it. I'm 62, so uh, it, hopefully it'll come back here. Um, what I would like to see is when we go into these countries, and again, what we saw when we were traveling from South Korea to different countries, South America, is to make sure that our diplomatic corps, our embassies, we're staffed to the point that they can get things done the way they need to. Um, and we've seen shortfalls in this in this administration. We've seen this in previous administrations. Um, again, we're going through changes. But I think, again, as a nation, my, my thing died here, um, it's time to change things. And I remember the story of this little girl, you know, they're cooking the, the Christmas ham, and uh, the mother was cutting the shank of the ham. And she put it in his pan, and she goes, Mom, why do you always do that? She goes, well, Grandma always did that. Well, why'd Grandma always do it? Well, I don't know. Let's call her. So they called Grandma up, and they said, Grandma, why do you always cut the end of the ham off? And she goes, well, that was easy. I never had a pan big enough for it to fit in. So, <laughs> and sometimes our policies are based on what we used to do, and we're still doing them. And it's like, why are we still doing that? So we need to come up to the time to the 21st century that's what I would like to see. And I forget the other part of your question. I don't even know if I answered your question. <laughs> that was a funny story, though. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question. So. Come right Hi, this is Jenny Russell from Hi, Save Jenny. the Children. Um, I really love your philosophy about you know the need for flexibility, the need for ownership at the country level. Um, I'm interested in how Congress can do a better job to support flexibility. And, um, you know, my colleague talked about the importance of domestic resource mobilization. We're really interested in finding ways that there can be more money for to support countries to improve their tax administration so they can raise more money uh, for pu uh, public revenues and we don't have to provide more development aid. How can Congress support m more creative ideas and flexible funding so that we can match the need at the country level with U.S. government funding? Man, I tell you, Jenny, that's probably going to be more up to you guys. Um, we can do only so much. And again, you know what our f fiscal uh, restraints are. You see mm -hmm. where we're heading if we don't have the willpower to change it. You know, government's neither good nor bad. It's the people within government that make these things up. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I stress you as organizations, what are you doing to make sure that's, that money's getting there? And you're with Save the Children, and we had this group of kids come in, or college students from the University of Florida, 
and they're all pre-meds and they're they wanted to save x amount like 12 million they wanted a vaccination program was going to save 12 million people and i says well that's really noble i said but shame on you and they're like what do you mean i says you're going to save all these children people are dying of starvation we don't have enough food i says so you're going to have 12 million people that are raised so that they can die and and they're looking at me like this fear and you guys probably are looking at me like that too <laughs> but i want them to think about that's a great and a noble cause, but what are you going to do to solve this problem? You know, and I think what you're doing is great, but we better be thinking about how are we going to feed these people? So to answer your question on how can there be more money, we're limited by money. But I think by working with other countries, and this is something with the Development Finance Corporation, it's going to empower more uh, bilateral uh, work or trilateral work with other countries but it has to be um, pivoting around a common goal. What are we trying to accomplish? You know, if you used Syria for an example, terrible foreign policy. You've got Russia going in there to help Syria for their reasons. You've got Iran going in there. You've got us in there. You've got Turkey in there. Nobody is trying to accomplish the same thing. They all are working kind of differently um, for different reasons. Those things don't work, and I think we've got enough track records through foreign policy around the world so again, if we're working with other countries, that's going to bring in more money. But we should sit down at the table to have the common goal, to get the buy-in from the country, to get the buy-in from how are you going to respond in that country? What are you bringing to the table? You know, um, and, and I think that's the only way we can do it in the way we are right now. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have. I wanted to just thank you again for thank you. sharing your, your time with yes, us and your insights and, and for the work that you're doing in Congress to sort of push forward uh, more effective. I think that's something that most people in the development community can agree on, that we need to have sort of a more efficient and effective aid delivery. I think people want to see it work better um, so we can reach more people. I, I, I really appreciate that, and if I may, you know, we're in the 21st century, and I was born in 55. I've seen wars through pretty much my whole life. I've seen enough wars. We, we don't need to do any more than that. We're better than that. We need to come together. We need to force government, or challenge government. I don't want to force anybody to do anything, but challenge them to change the narratives. You know, the policies we've used for the last 20 years, like grandma's baking pan, get a bigger pan. You know, find a way to get more money. We have to streamline and We've got a divide in this world, like I said, the tectonic shift in world powers. You've got a group of people over there that don't believe in Western philosophies. You've got people like us that believe in the Western ideologies. You know, I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, but I believe my rights come from a creator, not from government. Government's instituted by we the people to protect our, our rights. You know, that's my belief. But that's a belief of a large portion, portion of the world. And I just, uh, you guys, I'm, I'm well aware, I'm sure you saw Xi Jinping in the 19th World Congress where he said the era of China has come. It's time for them to take the center stage of the world. I take that as a personal threat. But saying that, there was an article, I think it was yesterday, that one of their foreign ministers said that the role of the people in that country was to serve the government. And when you serve a government, you're serving a few. When you ser a government serves the people, you're serving the many. And I think that's something we have to come together. The world is changing, and we have to make sure that we're out there not forcing people to accept our ideologies. And this is something I've seen too many times, that we want human rights, we want this, and we, that we all agree. And we want to instill those on another nation. My goal is, where are you at? Where do you want to go? Let's help you get there in, in baby steps. And you guys are the ones that are doing that. And I think, we, I think you've done a good job, but I think we all can agree we all can do better. And my goal is to do that in my short time in Congress. Because if you look at a timeline, I, I don't even know if I'll be a dot in the world history or the United States history or any of us. But the programs and the legacy we leave behind can last forever. So that's what I encourage you to do. And thank you for the opportunity to come by. Thank you.